All right. Uh, thank you, Stefan, and uh, everyone for sticking around for uh, this panel this afternoon. Uh, it's really exciting to be part of this inaugural uh, New York uh, Film Conference, and uh, of course we have the distinct pleasure of talking about maybe the most vague topic. <laughs> But uh, that's because it's a very uh, wide topic to cover, uh, working in the industry in New York. Uh, and we could probably all talk for days on what makes that such a unique ecosystem. But our panels here are going to, we're going to attempt to hone in on a few specific details and areas to which I think we all uh, would want to talk about and hear about ourselves. So um, I'm going to uh, kind of just generally introduce everyone. I can share. We share in New York, so we can do that. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, on the end here, we've got Zach from uh, Ghost Robot. We've also got producers Damon and Mary Jane in the center. And of course, we've got uh, John here from Entertainment Partners Financial Solutions. Um, so I'd love to just kind of start, and maybe Zach will start at the end with you. If you could just tell us a little bit about your background and coming into the industry, and especially working in New York, kind of how you came to be here. How I came to be here. Well, uh, no, I, I, I was uh, in film school in the early 90s. I got out in the mid-90s and had the good fortune of having produced a million short films at school. So that led me to production coordinating and production managing in the mid-90s in indie, pil indie film world, which once upon a time was all still shot on 35 millimeter films, pretty exciting day and age. Um, and, uh, and through the course of that, had the opportunity to work on a lot of other people's films as I made my way to um, uh, starting to produce my own work. And then in the early aughts, uh, started a production company called Ghost Robot with a, with a goal of focusing on short form work, uh, sort of branching out from the independent films to more advertising, branded content, music videos, and things like that as a way to sort of create a base and uh, infrastructure for continuing to explore production. So today, uh, Ghost Robot is a creative content studio and works across all media and all platforms. And we are uh, continue to work in independent films, but as well, a lot of um, commercial and, and branded work. Hi, I'm Damon Lane. Um, I started out originally at an international sales company in London called Capital Films. My first sort of foray into uh, the film world was actually in uh, accounting, uh, working uh, at that company, doing producer statements. But I uh, realized very early on that I wanted to do something much more creative in that company. And so they were very happy to have a free reader, read a lot of scripts, and uh, luckily, I was able to kind of wind my way into a head of uh, development and acquisitions job for that company. I spent five years there before I moved to New York because of this lady on my right, um, where since I've been, I consulted for other international sales companies, finding movies for them, acquiring movies for them to sell internationally. And then I spent four or five years at Zero Gravity Management, representing writers and directors, primarily up and coming talent, trying to break them into the Hollywood system and get them paid some, which was a bit of a struggle. Uh, and then newly in the last couple of years, decided that was not what I wanted to be doing. I wanted to produce full time and have since just sort of been doing my own projects under the same umbrella as Mary Jane at Next Wednesday. Um, I'm Mary Jane Skalski. I, I moved to New York uh, in the late 80s and I actually started out in the nonprofit side. And, uh, worked with an advocacy organization for filmmakers, and that was sort of how I started. And then in the early 90s, I started working with two established producers uh, at that time uh, at a company that they had formed called Good Machine. And the company lasted sort of through the 90s and sort of into the early early aughts, as Zach said. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, that was a company that some of the directors that we worked with, especially in the early days, were... Um, Ang Lee and Nicole Holof Center and Eddie Burns. And so my sort of early work was working on their films uh, in different capacities and also doing some development for the company and doing some sales for the company. We sort of started a, a foreign sales company at a certain point. And we were really, you know, it was the 90s where the, the industry was really kind of exploding 
exploding, and we were able to really take ad advantage of that as the as the marketplace was sort of increasing for independent films. Uh, and then, you know, sort of since Good Machine, so I've had other partners at some time at times, and have worked with you know producing partners or business partners, and uh, and then probably about you know, maybe like 12 years ago or so, I really just kind of went out on my own and sort of stopped having a, you know, a business partner as much as um, just looking for my own projects and trying to get movies made. Um, and that is, you know, next Wednesday is is that company. And, you know, I keep a relatively small slate of films. Uh, like everybody else, I want to love to find something to do in TV. Uh, and... Um, yeah, the last film I did is a, a film I have in post called American Animals that will, will hopefully be out late, you know, at some point in 2018. Hello, I'm John. Um, and I've always been in New York. I actually am pretty proud of the fact that, that I've worked for four different studios over the course of 30 some years, um, and always in New York. In fact, some of those jobs I got because I refused to move to the And they really did, I just refused to move, so I left. <laughs> um, but I, I, I specialize in finance. I produced independently. I worked as a studio executive. I was a financing guy, and um, and I left in 2006 to start producing independently at the worst possible time you could ever be out there trying to produce independently because the market collapsed and I couldn't raise any equity. Um, but I did notice that in at a time when the economy was really in the toilet. Um, tax credits were emerging, and they didn't seem to be disrupted at all by what was happening on Wall Street. So I, I decided to shift my business a little bit and focus on these tax credits, and, um, and actually turned it into a, financing these tax credits into a nice little business. And that's what I do now for Entertainment Partners, which is a big payroll company that you, you might be familiar with. And I run a little boutique bank within EP that finances tax credits, provides loans to independent producers, making independently financed movies, and they need the cash up front to use for their productions. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I want to kind of start with this. Uh, several of you, you know, kind of began working in New York in the 90s, and obviously there's been some huge shifts, and we kind of, you covered it a bit just recently in the last 10 years, there's been some dramatic shifts, and a lot of it does have to do with the tax incentives and the growth New York has seen from that. So. Um, you know, what kind of state uh, is New York in at, at this point, especially with this growth, uh, with new distribution platforms, with a lot of things going OTT? What's been kind of the big shift from New York in the 90s as this very known indie hub to where it is now? Um, John, you want to start with that? Yeah, I mean, when, when, I, when I was sitting at my desk at Miramax and sending movies like Chicago to Toronto, and gangs of the New York to Rome, and Texas Rangers to Alberta. Yeah, I was getting, Chicago went to Toronto. I was getting hate mail and horrible, horrible phone calls from union people and uh, union members, but also union leaders saying, my guys are out of work. Why are you sending all these movies to Canada? Why are you, why are you making Cold Mountain, a movie about the, about the Civil War in Romania? And I'm like, well, there's nothing to, there's, we can't afford to make these movies here, right? So this was before the tax credit in New York. And, you know, all the guys that do what I do, we all had a mandate, which was, you don't make a movie in a place where there's no incentive because we have an obligation to our shareholders to do this at the lowest possible price point. If you are an independent producer, again, you're not using your own money. And, and you know, if you are using your own money, great. Have that. God bless. But, but chances are, it's not your own money. And so it's, it is fiscally irresponsible to make a project in a place that doesn't offer incentives unless you are really rich. So, and, and I really, I stand by that. I think it's very true. And so we all take advantage of this stuff. And when New York finally passed legislation to support an incentive, Production started moving here, and I've seen, you know, over the course of my career, I've seen this movie a hundred times where people let these tax incentives just evaporate, just dissolve, because they don't think that they're 
they're creating enough jobs, they're not dumping enough money into the local economy, and then you lose all the entertainment business. And now you have all these craft people that are out of work, right? So New York right now is exploding with 46 or 48 TV shows, and over 150 independent films were made here um, this last year. It's extraordinary. Everybody's working. It's hard to find an accountant. It's hard to find a line producer because everybody's mm -hmm. working. Um, the only thing you don't see shooting in New York is a big budget studio movie, and that's because above the line people don't count with the New York credits. So that's why they go to places like Georgia. But it's you know it's incredibly healthy. The tax credit program is very healthy. It doesn't actually sunset until 2023, but they knew that. You know, a few years ago, they actually started talking about we have to prepare for 2019 mm -hmm. when this credit is going to sunset. And here we are in 2017, and it's already been extended to 2023. Yeah, definitely. Mary Jane, uh, what about you? I mean, working at Good Machine, which is, you know, I think very known in New York, um, kind of starting from there early on in your career to kind of where you are now, what are the major shifts you've really seen in the industry? Well, I mean, it's definitely had its ups and downs over, you know, since that time. But um, the, you, you know, the, the what I felt then um, that I think is different now is this idea that there's, um, that there was real community. You know, there were, I think at that point, like I said, I worked with two producers who had started the company, Ted Hope and James Seamus, and like their their desire when they as producers was to have a company and to have an office and to have, we had tons of interns and you know that company grew over time and that was sort of part of the plan. It was part of the plan in a way that would allow the company to make, have more freedom to make movies and make the movies that we wanted to make. But, but that was the goal and, and there were a lot of producers at the time and that was their goal too, like to have a company and to have a real infrastructure. I find that now because we, you know, it's gotten more expensive to, to live anywhere, you know, also to live in New York. I think the business has gotten a bit older, so people, you know, I used to live in a really tiny little studio, you know, like things have changed for people individually, things have changed in the, in the world. And, and also with technology, you don't quite need the same amount of infrastructure that you used to do. You know, one of my early jobs was, um, I would, I would coordinate Ang Lee's press, like not the press part of his press tours, but the physical part of him getting from place to place. And he'd do these press tours around the whole world. And that was like, that took up so much of my time. Now, I mean, to book travel for someone and hotels and all those things is much, much easier, much more simple. So I think because of all those things, I find a lot of producers now, we, we work in a, in a smaller way. There's not as many people who have real, like a large company with many employees or sort of are moving in that direction. So I think that's, to me, that's the biggest change that I've sort of felt over time. Okay. Uh, Zach, if I can see you down there. <laughs> um, so you, uh, you know, you started in features, you still do features, uh, but you also have a really interesting background with a lot of other formats. Um, including 360 immersive video, uh, a sci-fi comic book series uh, that I discovered, and then a lot of short form projects, commercials, music videos. So, you know, and I know you, you asked a question earlier just about um, the distribution of more short form content and kind of where that's headed. So uh, how is it, how have you seen the industry kind of change and uh, evolve with the types of work you're doing um, that you used to do and what you're doing now? Sure, well, I think, you know, one, I did, I, I'll jump back to the short form uh, question I asked earlier in a minute, but, but I think one pretty notable difference from, I think the first movie that I made that I produced personally was, was finished in 2000, and if you didn't get a distribution deal, from a network or a, or a theatrical distributor, the only way that film was gonna be seen is by sending somebody a VHS tape. So mom and dad got to see it and that was about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that was, so with the unfortunate reality of indie film if that distributor didn't come around. And today, you could have your feature film up globally 
within an hour, and that's a pretty unique change within the industry, I think, and, and something not to be taken lightly. It's both an advantage and a disadvantage because there is so much out there, but it's a pretty big difference that the, that the distribution mechanism is sort of in your hands, um, te technologically in your hands, that, you know, so the same problems that filmmakers have faced from the, from the very beginning of getting people to know about that film and, and marketing and advertising and you know word of mouth and how to get out there is still there but but in terms of the difference in making them that's a pretty massive difference that that the audience can get you can get your film out to anyone anytime finding them is another story but but um so i think that that is a that is a pretty interesting change from then to now of how that has affected filmmakers and i don't know how many of those filmmakers still the holy grail is getting a theatrical distribution for your film because that whether it means more people are going to see it or not more likely if you sold it straight to HBO or even to Netflix, a lot more people are gonna see it than that first theatrical experience. But nonetheless, there's still that cachet that comes along with that experience. But um, but I have been a pretty big proponent from, for a long time about pushing the technology and about trying to find you know, new ways to tell stories. And, I'm, and, I've, and I feel like it's finally catching up. One thing I've been trying to push for a long time is short form like serialized content. And, and like, I would love to see five and 10 minute episodes happening and with like, you know, Crackle and Crunchyroll and, you know, a lot of the other like, you know, uh, media platforms that are out there. And as many filmmakers like Tarantino and Christopher Nolan that are bitching about, you know, digital distribution, it's a totally viable and real evolution. And, and you know, Snapchat's gonna be the next most important distribution platform not 70 millimeters, so we should be thinking about what we can do with that, and I think that short form distribution of serialized content is really gonna be a pretty exciting, you know, next wave, because I'd be psyched to go see, you know, a series of short, you know, we'll just go straight to the top and say, when Star Wars starts releasing 10 minute episodes, I'm gonna be there and give them my five bucks, you know? So, <laughs> you know, I, I'd like to see it go that way, and I think that there is going to be, you know, that could be the next wave of what we're seeing, and, and will also open up possibilities for filmmakers and, and storytellers in that world. Do any do any of you, other of you here on the panel have any experience uh, in content creation on short form as well? I'm, I'm just doing one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. It's it's like a whole new world yeah. because there's such a you know it's like I know whether it's big or small I, uh, I, the the protocol of making a feature is sort of like I can could do that in my sleep in some ways, not the actual creatively making it, but the business side of it, the short form world is, is all different. So I'm, I've been talking to Zach. Talking to <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but, to, but to rewind real quick, my business is not selling cool short content. My business is selling advertising and branded content. Like that's what we do every day. And that's very different. Those advertisers have money and that's what they pay us to do. People aren't actively paying for serialized short form. Yet. I just started talking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I will. I, I I had just come, the experience in reverse, where I spent years working with a filmmaker who made a short film, very very decorated, like really decorated short film, and he wanted to turn it into a full length feature, and we worked on this for hour uh, for for years, and and I just finally came to the re realization that. He was basically telling the exact same story, but just taking longer to tell it. <laughs> and I, so I share that with you only because if anyone is working on doing that, don't make that mistake. Because yeah. we really spent, I think we spent six years pounding the pavement <laughs> to try to raise financing and realize, oh my God, we're just telling the same story. Right. And Over that, two hours. And that's what a lot of filmmakers I find do. You go to the film festivals and they say, we've created this short as a bouncing board for this feature, but it is, I think that's an important note to, yeah. to realize that sometimes you've made the best story within the time, mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily mean that that same story is going to evolve into a better feature. Mm -hmm. right. um, I want to go back because, you know, we started talking, John, a little bit about uh, the tax incentives and how that's you know, affected the market. Um, but you also made an interesting point that it, you know, it doesn't cover above the line. Uh, it also doesn't talk, touch documentary um, and also reality television or reality work. Um, you know, what do you think are the kind of upsides and downsides to that? And 
um, you know, maybe we'll start with you, John, and then Mary Jane and Damon. I'd love to kind of get your perspective on, you know, how it's affected the community here versus other states that are, you know, setting up their incentives differently. Well, the real genesis of, of the whole DOC and, and uh, unscripted programming, not counting, goes back to 94 when, when this discussion first started in New York and, and the, the real focus was how do we get the studios and the networks to bring their large budget projects to New York? And the answer was a tax incentive. And it's, it was very short-sighted to not include, reality, remember back then, there was Project Runway and Project Greenlight, and that was it, that was it. And I worked on both of those. And that was all there was. Um, so nobody really paid attention to Unscripted. The documentary issue, though, was a huge oversight and something that they just didn't focus on because that wasn't the end game. The end game was studios and networks. And the, it's a real tragedy because over the years, there's been a really robust discussion about how do we get to include documentaries? And everybody's fear, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate fear, is you have legislation that supports this tax incentive. When you open up legislation, and this does not do just with tax credits, you open up legislation on anything, you are inviting people to make changes or get rid of it altogether. And it takes a lot of support on a statewide level to get enough votes for people to pass legislation, right? And there, there's a reason why now you get 35% in upstate New York than 30%, right, in New York. That's because there are lots of legislators in Buffalo and Rochester and Syracuse and Utica were complaining that this tax incentive in New York wasn't helping them in their jurisdictions, it was only helping Manhattan. And in order to incentivize people to go upstate, they had to give away a little bit more money, but you, Joe Fira was just on this panel. He, his company financed, and I participated in the financing of Tomorrowland, which shot in Buffalo. And people in upstate New York are ecstatic because people are getting jobs in Buffalo, right? And Rochester, and Troy, and Albany, and it's great. Um, but to open up the legislation to see if you can include documentaries now, you run the risk of a legislator, uh, uh, group in, in western New York or up in Lake Placid area in the Adirondacks voting no, get rid of it. I've never seen any action. So that's, that's, the, that's kind of why we are where we are with that. Um, Mary Jane, what has been your kind of experiences? I know we've talked before about a couple projects that you've uh, that you've done, which has made decisions based on obviously where it makes the most sense to shoot and the incentive and how that's affected. So how has it changed the way uh, that you have produced films? Well, I mean, I sort of came up producing movies as the incentive was sort of coming up. So it's a little bit, there was not so much of a before and after, although there was definitely a time where the, the rate went up quite a bit and that made a big difference. Um, and that, that almost coincided with me going out on my own at the same time when I sort of think about it. Um, I mean, I think the incentive here is great because it's so stable, like you can always know you can, it's, it's, it's easy to access. I mean, some people, you know, there's, there's how, when the money comes back and where, but, but you, you, it's very dependable, you know. And so, uh, I mean, I love it. And I think because I think because it didn't have an above the line component and because the industry that was so much here at the time were lower budget independent films that doesn't actually usually have a disproportionate above the line. So I think what it did is it helped the, spread the money around a lot to a lot of different productions that then allowed for a lot of crew people to really learn their craft and continue to work and really sort of build you know a life. So I think, um, all of that makes the, you know, it's accessible to use the incentive and 
you know, I don't, I mean, other than like, yes, sometimes we can't find accountants and sometimes it can be hard to find a line producer, but by and large, like, you don't, you don't, I don't hear people in New York talk about, oh, there's only two crews, you know, where a lot of places you go, that's sort of the thing. Like, what's it like to shoot there? Well, it's great, but there's only two crews. So if so two other productions are there, you may not be able to crew up. You know, that's not really something we, that I've ever faced here. Like, there's, you know, they'll always, it's a very, very deep crew base. And that makes it easy to know that, to be able to say, like, yes, I can shoot my movie here. And sometimes in other places, you can't say that quite as vehemently, that, yes, I know I can make it happen there with the incentive, with the crews and all those things. Here, I can almost always say, like, if creatively we can shoot here, I feel very confident saying, like, yes, we can shoot here. Yes, this would be the, how the credit will compute and feel pretty confident that I don't lose sleep over it. You know, it's going to work out. Yeah, I think, and I think the only time we've had it where it was uh, a problem for us to shoot in New York was when we had a disproportionate huge above the line on a small budget movie. And, you know, we wanted to do New York. We looked at, I mean, the filmmaker wanted to shoot Detroit, which obviously has no tax credit at all. Um, so that, when push came to shove and we started running those numbers, it just made no sense at all to kind of do that. And then again, as we started getting more numbers in and international sales figures and looking at kind of the bottom line of the movie, it became very clear that we had to have an above the line tax credit state. So then immediately New York was out. And so I think we'll end up in Cleveland for that reason, where we'll end up netting sort of 550,000 in tax credit versus a post-tax credit in New York and nothing out of Detroit. So it became very simple. It was very heartbreaking because we really felt like, oh, once we run the numbers, it'll work. And then it didn't. <laughs> it was like, what? What? Why? How are this? You know, won't compute. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, We've talked a lot about, you know, how things have changed, and I think it's really been in the last six years with the increase, the major increase to the 30, 35 percent tax, you know, credit. I think that's where we've really seen a huge growth in more facilities being able to be established, people who had uh, places in other states, in Hollywood, opening spots here in New York and kind of helping uh, grow the business. Also, the expansion of various studios and moving more things out to Brooklyn, and then also more things upstate. Do you think, you know, do you think we're at a place where we're gonna hit a cap at some point and we're not gonna be able to keep up with this amount of growth? You know, uh, I know you mentioned uh, Mary Jane, the crew base, you know, you feel is, is pretty deep, but you know, earlier on another panel, you we were talking about, you get to a point where it's like, well, we're so busy that, you know, we've, we're on like the, the third choice key grip here. So do you feel like, you know, we're kind of going to hit a threshold at some point with this growth? I don't. I don't. No, I don't either. I, I mean, mean there'll always be more people coming up. There'll be more people getting trained. I mean, there's, there's sometimes bumpy parts of the road. Like when the, in, when the incentive went from like 10 to 30, a lot of productions came into town very quickly. And that was a tough time, you know, but it, worked itself out, you know, more, you know, and I think because the, because it's so stable, um, that helps it work itself out because someone is willing to start learning their craft and stay here and build a life here and train more people here and they're not necessarily going, having to leave so often to do work. So I think it, it, it helps to kind of grow that base. Yeah, I don't, the, I don't think The state's so. flexible too. I mean, this, this, this state really, I mean, we're blessed that we have a film commission not only at the city level, but at the state level, that's really flexible and really willing to work with you and help you. When I look at the list, you know, you have, you have to shoot on a qualified stage, right? A qualified on their list mm -hmm. facility. But that, you know, years ago, that was a short list, mm -hmm. right? It was like all the studios that we know, Silver Cup, Coffin Astoria, Chelsea Pierce. Now it's really long mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's they've allowed people to take big box stores that are mm -hmm. empty now and, turn them into studio space for the purposes of a shoot. And, and it's not just in New York City, it's all over the place. I mean, now people are actually shooting in all five boroughs. I, I was telling people for years, Staten Island looks like it could be anywhere in New England. Go to Staten <laughs> Island. And everyone was like, who goes to Staten Island? And I'm like, you should. I shot, I love shooting Staten Island. I shot Staten Island for upstate yeah. New York um, for a whole feature. Couch camp. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, filmmakers have to be flexible, right? I mean, you can't be, you know, it, like when you were talking about doing the budget comparisons, I mean, sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes you, 
you know, you, you do these comparative budgets and you kind of go, well, it actually doesn't make sense to be here. Maybe we need to look at something else. Good producers and good filmmakers know how to be flexible and that's what ultimately helps you get your movie made, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. if you, if you, you know, you always kind of go to your first choice first, but you have to be open to the idea that you may have to make some concessions or you may have to make some adjustments. I think but I don't think New York will ever. No, I don't think you need the studio space to be able to be competitive for certain shows that come here and want stage and location. You know, I know like Marvel Netflix, they're sort of 60, 40 in terms of, you know, shooting on the stage versus location. Right. One would assume that you come here because you want New York as a location because it's New York, right? Which is true of many things. But I think you need to service all this great production and TV shows that are coming in. That's what they need. So they're going to need that space. So I yeah. think there's plenty and you've got to have it to be competitive with Georgia and everybody else. What would you say has been uh, the biggest change in kind of the community and the cultural shifts, you know, with, uh, you know, interns, how that's changed with the educational programs. I know made New York, there's a lot of different venues and outlets where New York really is trying to, I think, make sure that there is a future industry for all this growth that we're creating. Um, you know, how have you kind of experienced that? But I think because there's sort of less overall you know, because producers aren't sort of aspiring to build a big company and take on a big overhead or a big footprint and real estate is expensive. So, like, I use interns, but it's harder for me to. And, you know, and they don't, they're not coming to, like, an office every day to work with me in some ways. And I think that has changed. You know, I learned a lot just by being able to hear what other people were saying on the telephone and, you know, all of those sort of things. I think that can be, I think maybe those experiences are more limited. And then there's just been, you know, there's been court cases with interns. People get shy of them. You know, some financiers, when you're making a movie, they have a no intern policy. You can't use interns on the production. So I think those, it, I think it gets a bit harder. It does. I mean, you know, the, the irony in all of this is that, you know, parents send their kids to college and they spend all this money. And the thing that the parents are the most concerned about is, what are you going to do to get my kid a job when they graduate, right? And in turn, so there's such a huge focus on internships, and there should be, right? I mean, it's a great way to learn. But, but students are obsessed with it, right? And then at the same time, you have all these lawsuits that have been filed, so all the places where the opportunities really existed, where you had lots of different departments willing to take on interns, won't do it anymore because they're, they're afraid. They're, and, and also, it, it doesn't work the way it used to work. It, I used to always have interns, you know, and it was kind of like, just pay attention, follow me around, pay attention, yeah, you can help me out with some stuff, but listen to me on the phone, listen to what I'm saying to people, you know, read what I'm reading so that you kind of understand what's happening. And, um, and now, and that was my program, right? That was my, that was my syllabus. <laughs> you know, you can't do that now, right? Yeah. You have to have a real training program. And it's, you know, it feels a little bit more like, you know, a bank training, you know, like yeah. Goldman Sachs training. Yeah. You know, and I, a lot of people are nervous about taking on that responsibility when they already have a, a whole bunch of stuff that they're supposed to be doing. So that's a real challenge. I mean, the Made in New York program is a phenomenal, phenomenal program, but it's competitive and it's small. Yeah, you know, the Made in New York program is awesome. And, yeah. if, and if anybody out there is making a movie, certainly look them up because they have a lot of great resources for, for filmmakers. But we have a pretty robust intern internship program at Ghost Robot, but again, we're kind of in production on something every week. And so it's a little different than an independent film producer where there could be six months or 12 months of development that is just mm -hmm. script reading and, and location research and finance research and stuff where it is a lot less. And, uh, you know, I actually, to this day, I think my mother still asks me, are any of these jobs paying you? Which is from <laughs> once upon a time when I was not getting paid on any of the jobs that I was working on, but I learned a fucking lot working on those jobs, you know, for free. That was all totally important, you know, it was incredible. Uh, you know, experience, even though it was 14 or 16 hours of work for nothing, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, to get to yeah, where we were. I don't know? think you can do free internships anymore. Uh, so, you know, so it is a, you know, it is, it's, it's unfortunate. 
it, there's a reality of it, but I think it's also it's the reality of so many things where there is a, a, a possibility for abuse that happens in certain circles, and so it's super important that, that there is a recognition of what those are, but there's sort of the internship, and then there's the like, hey, let's go work for free on this buddy's movie, and there's kind of like a little bit of gray area, I think, in between those two things, and, uh, and it's, it's, so it's just kind of critical that, that companies that can, I think, do, but as you've said, a lot of them are closing those opportunities down because of lawsuits and perhaps, you know, shady activities, but, you know, key, key thing is you can't replace paid labor with unpaid labor. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. So uh, I just have one more question and then we'll jump out and take questions uh, here from the audience. But, um, you know, we've talked a lot in other panels about the new technologies, um, you know, VR, immersed video, all the new things that are kind of happening. We've also spent a lot of time talking about Netflix and Amazon and new distribution platforms. Um, I know entertainment partners, I know you guys have really come up with some really interesting and, and unique things to help, uh, you know, and kind of work with the technology to make your part easier. Um, can you maybe explain a little bit about what you've been doing with that? Uh, and then, you know, we'll kind of talk a little bit about, you know, how everybody here is shifting, you know, with the technology or what they find might be the challenges with the new technology. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my little division, EP Financial Solutions, um, is just kind of does stuff the old-fashioned way, mostly because I'm so challenged technically. But I will tell you that I did watch the entire season one of The Crown on my phone in bed. <laughs> I don't know if they would like yeah, that. But, the, but what Entertainment Partners, my parent company, is doing it's really interesting. They're really um, trying, they've taken production paperless, right? So you can do everything on your phone, right? So when you are hired for a job, all your start paperwork is in a phone. Um, your, all your pay is in your phone, your call sheets, production reports, um, sides from scripts, even entire scripts or watermark scripts are all delivered to your phone. And when I say your phone, I mean it could be your tablet, your whatever. Um, but it's, it's all like here, and it's meant to help productions be completely mobile. And you know, I, I look at some of this technology today, and I want to weep when I think about all the paper that I had to push for 30 years. In my, my office, it, at, at, even at Miramax Films, it was four walls of bookcases from floor to ceiling with production binders. I, no art, no plants, no flowers, <laughs> nothing. Bookcases and full of binders. And it was, you know, this awful way to live. This is phenomenal, right? And so that's, what, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for anyone who's ever made sides and then <laughs> you get ahead of the game and then the script changes, like, oh, God. Those days. Yeah, I, I mean, it, and also with budgeting, it's, you know, EP owns Movie Magic budgeting, Movie Magic scheduling, and we have this thing called Smart Hub and Smart Studio and Smart Start. And, and again, it's all meant so that if there's a change, like if, if an actor is sick and you have to all of a sudden change the schedule, rework the schedule, you go into your phone and you can actually move stuff around. And it's brilliant because it notifies everybody that needs to know. It sends out call sheets, it sends out new script pages to people that need to know, and it's all like right there. And it's, it's fascinating, it, it really is. It's put, a, it's put a lot of demands on production and post-production though that now, once upon a time, you could have a couple hours to get something done and now it needs to get done <laughs> yes. that fast, whether it's an editorial change, a color change, a, <laughs> a script change, yeah. a you know, distribution you know, link or whatever yeah. it is. And uh, to be the old curmudgeon in the room, uh, kids just don't know how to talk on the phone anymore. And, it, and it's actually, for, in a production world, it's kind of a killer because communication is key. And if it's all just text messages and emails, I can tell you how much just gets lost in translation. I'm like, pick up the damn phone and you know, call them. Do you know I called somebody? <laughs> So, so somebody called me and I called them back on their cell phone and they weren't picking up, so I texted them. And, <laughs> and then they answered, like, right? And then they, and then they <laughs> yeah. called me right back. I'm like, wow, we are so obnoxious mm -hmm. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I think we've all seen the major shifts and, you know, even with the changes in what distribution asks for, I can't remember the last time I've actually had to, you know, touch a digibeta tape, which is an amazing thing, uh, but you know it also has these new challenges with 
you know, people wanting to see HDR and everything is 4K um, and you can only shoot with these cameras for these types of projects if you want it to go to this platform. Um, you know, what do you think are some of the potential downsides or challenges to that? Or, you know, have you really had to deal much with that yet? No. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I like to yell at, um, at distribution partners where they're asking me to up res old standard def video to HD to fit on their platform where I can say that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. But, uh, but no, it's, uh, I'd say just from a filmmaking point of view, trying to keep up with technology and what the new, you know, what those new deliverables are going to be at each stage of the game and, you know, and it's, it's different every six months, you know, mm -hmm. so um, it certainly is a, uh, it is a challenge and while technology has put the, the tools in the hands of the filmmakers in phenomenal new ways where you can finish a film on a laptop almost um, as we start pushing into the 4K and the 6K and the 8K and the HDR and all these other like pretty incredible, you know, new evolutions of digital um, capture. It is, um, you know, it is challenging that infrastructure that was within reach of a lot of, you know, filmmakers working in the independent world and it's starting to stretch those possibilities because you really do, you know, for, for 10 years, you could work in HD in on a laptop or an iMac and then now it's just starting to like crest back into that world where you need a lot more technical back end and, and real post-production services to do that film finishing. And there was sort of this sweet spot of like HD was it and that was kind of like how we finished a lot of movies for, for 10 years and now I think it's starting to break back into the like if you're going to be mastering an HDR you got to go do a whole nother color grade and you, you need to be working on you know monitors that you're at a real post-production facility and you're not just doing it on like you know uh, some of that technology isn't necessarily within reach of the lower end of the uh, of the indie film spectrum. So what do you think then is going to be or is the most exciting, uh, the thing you're looking most forward to seeing in the future of filmmaking in New York then? Mary Jane, David. I know I mean, that's a very loaded, large question. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, what I'm, I'm excited about, I feel like it's easier to reach an audience. I'm excited, so like, so I have projects that maybe 10 years ago I would not know I would think, well, I can't, I can't make this. It's not necessarily theatrical. You know, how am I going to convince people of that? Now I don't feel like if I like it, I think, okay, I can figure this out one way, shape, or form. So that that excites me. You know, or or you know, I read something a couple of months ago, and it was very long. It was like a very long script, and you know, the the writer director said, oh, yeah, I'm working on trying to get it down. But then I read it, and I was like, I actually think. If you, should be longer, you know, like, and, and that, that's valid because it's like, well, maybe we can do this as a series or something, you know, like that to me is really exciting that I don't feel as constrained by how to, you know, how to fit into this sort of 90, 110 minute, you know, theatrical release. Although it is still what I would love to have, I don't have to fit everything I want to do into that box. That's exciting to me personally. I think the same, yeah. And every every idea, every piece of material that comes to us now, we can definitely look at it in a very different light in terms of what that content could be, how to extend it, shorten it. Uh, more people coming to me, for instance, to do the short content that we've been talking about. So maybe I'll do 20, 10 minute episodes of something on a new platform. So yeah, it's exciting to just actually make stuff, right? And get things done. And getting a feature film financed is still incredibly difficult. So. If you have more avenues, more ways to make content and make a film, make a series, whatever you're going to do, then that's great, you know. Zach, what are you most excited about? Oh, I, I, to not parrot these other two, I do. I am pretty excited about the just the the, the the formats breaking down and changing in in new and exciting ways. And 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 while that's happening, I think what stayed the same, and we kind of touched on it earlier, is that I think that the crews are. One thing that hasn't changed in, in since I started in the 90s up to now is there's still great crews in New York City and they're continuing to work and, and, and it doesn't matter which format they're working in, it's all still applicable skill set, whether you're doing a TV show, a feature film, a, you know, a short film, a VR film, uh, you know, all of the above. And I think that's pretty, that's, that's pretty awesome is that you get to work with the same people just exploring new and different storytelling frontiers and, and uh, so New York's a great place to do it. I have to ask you now, John. I, you know, I, I, 
I think it's technology. I think it's, it's so cool to see the way people can experience things kind of on a global basis all at the same time. And I, I'll never forget the experience for lots of reasons, but I'll, I'll tell you that on election night in 2016, I was at a party and I left because I was obviously feeling very low and things were taking a real bad turn and I walked through Times Square and it was packed with people and everybody in Times Square was watching the returns everywhere, right? So, so every screen in Times Square was broadcasting the election returns and it was silent too. So there was this collective experience in Times Square that I'd never seen before. You know, and it was really awesome. I mean, take the content out of it and the situation out of it, the fact that the whole of Times Square was full of people and everybody is having the same experience at the same time and nobody knew each other was really cool. And, I, and the idea that you can do that today, I find fascinating. Yeah, yeah that's pretty incredible. Um, so uh, before we finish up, I just want to see if we have any questions from anyone. Uh, one second, I think she's bringing you the mic. Um, I just have a question about how you feel uh, about the, the, the theatrical exhibitors in New York, because after Landmark closed, I was like, ah, there, there are these uh, theaters that can really champion films by New York filmmakers, and I just wanted to know as New York filmmakers if you have an opinion about you know, your relationship with like the Angelica Film Center and those places that really cultivate and, and, and can support a New York filmmaker and seeing one of our <laughs> fallen, I just wonder you know, how you feel about that and is there a way we can maybe kind of work together to make sure that they're still there to support our small films or our independent films rather. Well, I, think, I think there's a bunch popping up right now. I mean, the Metrograph is awesome. Nighthawk is awesome. You know, Alamo's a pretty big chain at this point, but it's still awesome. You know, like they're, you know, I feel like there's a pretty good environment for indie exhibitors right now in New York. And in fact, I feel like they might be doing better than the big, than the big, than the big chains at the moment. And whether they're competing on a scale of, you know, reclining seats and hot and cold running champagne, they are keeping the like indie <laughs> filmmaker, you know, they're keeping indie films in there. I mean, just the like pre-roll stuff that happens at the Alamo is like, I'd go early to watch that because it's always super thoughtful and they're doing a great job of like making that part of the experience in a good way as opposed to bombarding us with commercials, you know, but, you know, but I don't see movies, I have kids. Yeah. <laughs> same, same, yeah. same. But when I do go, when we go, we, I was so excited. I mean, I think like, you know, the best way to support them is go. Yeah. You know, you gotta go. I mean, there's sometimes when friends have movies that are opening and I'll buy tickets, even though I know we're not going, but like I just buy the tickets to just show that there's, you know. But the quad appetite. and the village right down here, I mean. Yeah, a lot of great places. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, in the back. Oh. Oh. Sorry, guys. Right. <laughs> All right, we'll come ask us questions separately when we have some coffee. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Good work.